which is first in a series of uh, Life in New England uh, in honor of the 40th anniversary of the size founding in 1966. Uh, some of these lectures are funded in part by a grant from Maine Humanities Council. Uh, our lecturer tonight uh, really needs no introduction. We uh, originally thought he was going to talk about some other topic tonight, but he had a Civil War uh, event he had to go attend, and so we forgive him for that. And then he wanted to change the topic, so but I was fine because uh, we were just finishing a course in I made in the Civil War, so it sort of made a wonderful dessert after the after the meal we had earlier this year. So uh, we are del delighted tonight to have Earl Shuttleworth uh, with us tonight. He needs no introduction to Bethel. He's been here many, many times. He's a great friend of the society. And uh, we've enjoyed having him all these years. And since I think, this, I think this is the first time he has become the state historian since uh, he uh, has been here. So we have not only the state historian, but the state preservation, historic preservation officer and director of the uh, Maine Historic Preservation Commission. So, uh, and he's going to talk on the subject of silent sentinels, Maine Civil War monuments. Without further ado, Earl Shelburne. Thank you. We're going to start this evening with a scene that is familiar to many of you. Uh, it's featured in the illustrated history of Bethel. And it is a, a photograph uh, owned, I believe, by um, the uh, Blue Academy of the Bethel Zouaves, which were uh, a little company of uh, local boys who, uh, in part, dressed up in uh, Civil War uniforms, in part, uh, uh, had their own uh, school clothing. When they assembled on Main Street around 1862, this was a little company that was organized by Dr. Uh, N. Uh, T. True. Uh, and uh, it, it really shows that uh, the Civil War uh, reached into every uh, village and town in Maine, had a tremendous impact. And one can hypothesize that some of these young men in their mid-teens early in the war may actually have gone on to, to serve in the war. During the war, when the war was still very much in progress, of course, very sadly, uh, many uh, Maine boys and men uh, were sent back from the battlefield uh, for internment. And the city of Bangor was the first community in Maine uh, to officially recognize the Civil War dead. In 1834, Bangor had established a beautiful garden cemetery, the second garden cemetery of its kind in America, the first uh, being Mount Auburn in, near Cambridge. And Mount Hope Cemetery was the site in 1864 for the Mis municipality of Bangor to purchase a lot where fallen soldiers could be interred and on that lot was raised the very first Civil War monument in Maine. And we see that in this early stereopticon view, a very simple granite shaft. And just a few days ago, in the old Bangor newspapers, I discovered a letter that uh, Governor Samuel Coney had sent from Augusta to the dedication of this memorial in June of 1864. He could not attend, and he wrote to the citizens of Bangor to rescue the memory of our soldiers from oblivion, every municipality should be required to erect a monument in its cemetery to our illustrious dead. Let it be a plain shaft and endure as enduring as the granite of our hills, and on it let be inscribed the names of the fallen heroes. And that, at least for the early period of Civil War monuments in Maine, became the template. And so the earliest monuments erected immediately after the war are these very simple obelisks or shafts which are not unlike many of the Victorian monuments that we see in cemeteries uh, for private individuals and families. The second monument is this beautiful marble monument in front of the uh, old uh, town hall in uh, Gorham, erected in 1866 uh, with an eagle atop it. And then, a year later, in 1867, uh, the city of Bath erected uh, this very handsome granite monument in front of their new courthouse, again uh, topped uh, with an eagle. The uh, town of Hollowell 
uh, followed suit in 1868. And like the city of Bangor, they located their simple granite shaft, appropriately made of Hollowell granite, because there were major granite quarries in Hollowell, and we'll be hearing more about those later. Uh, but in 1868, uh, they dedicated uh, this uh, simple monument in the cemetery uh, just uh, north of the village. Virtually identical in style to the monument in Hollowell, and, but of marble rather than of granite was this monument built in 1872, four years later, in the cemetery in Brewer overlooking the Penobscot River. And the design for the Hollowell Monument was made by a local architect who worked in the granite quarries to interpret designs as they came in from all over the country for major public buildings. Uh, he would oversee the cutting of the granite. His name was Alexander Curia. He had formerly been a ship carver in the 1850s along the Kennebec River in the shipyards. And he was the one who designed this monument. And then, in turn, the Brewer Monument in design was based directly upon it. In 1869, uh, uh, the um, town of Fairfield uh, built this monument, a little bit more elaborate, on their town common. Uh, and this was of Hollowell granite. And then closer to home, also in 1869, this simple obelisk was erected in the town square in South Paris. And it was designed by a local stone cutter. And many years later, it was moved to the park when the automobile came in and, uh, and kind of threatened it. And so uh, now it, it, it rests very gracefully uh, in the center of the park. But this is one of the early uh, monuments uh, in Maine. It's no surprise that on the uh, island of Vinyl Haven, which sent many men to the Civil War, that there would be an early granite monument. Because like Hollowell, uh, Vinyl Haven was the location of important quarries. And so the simple obelisk monument at the right, the <coughs> old public library was added uh, several decades later. Uh, this monument is of Vinyl Haven granite and built in 1870. The Gardner Common, where I live and I drive by this monument every day, uh, the city of Gardner erected this Hollowell granite monument in 1875, again in this shaft or obelisk style. This style was being used as late as the 1880s and into the early 1900s. Here we find a rural crossroads below Booth Bay, West Southport, just a little village. But in the center of that village, a simple uh, obelisk monument from 1885 in granite. And as late as 1903, uh, the uh, granite monument in Norwich Walk in this case made primarily from granite from quarries in Norwich Rock. Now the large cities in Maine, particularly Augusta, <coughs> Lewiston, and Portland, did more elaborate monuments than the ones that we've just seen. In 1882, the city of Augusta erected this grand monument with a base, uh, a full column, and a statue of freedom on the top. And this was um, uh, the, the uh, bronze elements of this uh, monument were cast at the National Art Foundry in New York. Uh, and the rest of it was hollow granite. This is in near the traffic circle now in, in Augusta. And probably the most elaborate and the most expensive of the monuments uh, was built in Monument Square in Portland and dedicated in 1891. The base is of uh, North J granite, and it was designed by Richard Morris Hunt, based upon his design for the base that he did in New York Harbor for the Statue of Liberty. And the uh, figure of Our Lady of Victories was the work of a Webster, Maine native sculptor named Franklin Simmons, who also contributed the designs for a grouping of figures of the Army and the Navy on either side of the base. Now, Portland made 
uh, a spectacular contribution to the war effort. There were 30,000 people living in Portland during the Civil War. By the end of the war, 5,000 of those men living in Portland uh, had uh, been in the war, one-sixth of the population. Here, it, from uh, an early photograph in Franklin Simmons' studio in Rome, we see a photograph of the uh, army grouping uh, that is on one side of the Our, Our Ladies of Victory monument in Monument Square. An officer with uh, uh, artillerymen on, on the left and uh, riflemen on the right. And while most of the figures are allegorical, we find that in the naval grouping that the officer in the center is none other than Admiral Farragut. And it's rather appropriate because ultimately Admiral Farragut would die in Maine. Uh, after the Civil War, he uh, was uh, uh, at times at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, and he died there in uh, 1870. Franklin Simmons Uh, was one of America's major Victorian sculptors. Although born in Webster, Maine in 1839, uh, he spent most of his life in Rome, Italy. He, his main career was from his uh, birth in 1839 until 1865, where he grew up in Bath. He was in Washington, D.C. right after the Civil War from 1865 to 67, and then in Italy from 1867 to 1913. At the time that he was doing the monumental figure on the top of the Portland uh, monument, he was visited by the King of Italy. Uh, the King of Italy had heard about this sculptor and was so impressed by it that he gave um, Franklin Simmons a special uh, honor. One of Simmons' first sculptures uh, in Maine dealt specifically with a Civil War personage. This is an early photograph of the very handsome, full-life uh, granite statue of General Hiram Berry. Major General Berry was from Rockland, and he was the only Civil War general in Maine, from Maine to be killed in the Civil War. Uh, and his body was brought back to his family plot in Rockland. And over it, in 1865, the family erected this elaborate monument, a full-life uh, sculpture of him. Interestingly, it was based upon a photograph taken of General Barry in the studio of the famous Civil War photographer Matthew Brady uh, in New York City. And it's very fortunate that this photograph existed because it gave Simmons the opportunity to create a very lifelike replication of uh, General Barry. Simmons uh, was very involved in Civil War sculpture. Uh, in um, 1890, he was commissioned by the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the uh, National Civil War Veterans Organization, to create a full-life statue of General Grant. And this is that initial statue, which was to go into the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. Well, when the sculpture was finished in 1894, uh, critics charged that uh, Grant uh, looked almost sorrowful. He looked too serious uh, in, in this. And uh, the GAR and various congressional members uh, rejected this version of the sculpture. And Simmons was forced to go back to the drawing board and create a second lifelike uh, grant, uh, which uh, well, finally was accepted in 1900. And uh, actually, Maine won out because of this rejection. Because when Simmons died in 1913, the entire contents of the studio in Rome was willed to the city of Portland by him. And those wonderful sculptures, including the first grant that was intended for the Capitol, ended up at the Portland Museum of Art, where you can see them today. So Washington's loss was our gain. I speak at some length about Simmons because he has a special significance to the history of Maine Civil War monuments. He was the creator of what could very well be, certainly for Maine and probably for New England, was the first silent sentinel, the first standing soldier uh, with his rifle. The city of Lewiston commissioned uh, Sands in 1866 to do a bronze statue of a soldier. 
It was dedicated in 1868, and we see it here. It's still in Kennedy Park today. Visited it recently. The, uh, the interesting thing is that most um, experts claim that Martin Milmore, a Boston sculptor, had created the first standing soldier of this kind for Forest Hill Cemetery outside of Boston. That was 1867. We have 1866. <laughs> and here is an old stereo view of a side view of uh, Simmons um, standing soldier with the old um, Congregational Church, Pine Street Congregational Church, long gone on Pine Street in the background in downtown Lewiston. But as I say, the, um, the pedestal and the uh, soldier are still in Kennedy Park. Now, interestingly, 10 years later, the sculpture that Milmore had created for Forest Hills was replicated in this lovely bronze copy and set up in the public park in downtown Waterville, where it was used as Waterville's Civil War monument. There were a few other fully bronze cast soldiers that appeared on the main scene into the early 1900s. Here we're looking at the public library in Pittsfield, which was opened in 1904, and this lovely building, which has a center pavilion and then these arm-like uh, wings on either side, was really designed to be not only a library, but also a backdrop for a public park where the monument was to be the centerpiece. And both the library and the monument were erected in 1904, uh, granite base but bronze soldier standing in attention with his rifle, and a virtually identical monument was erected in front of the Madison Public Library four years later in 1908. Here we have the monument in Saco, which was built uh, in 1907. It is a sculpture called Victory Crowning the Returning Soldier, and it was made of sheet copper with bronze finish by a mail order company called the, the W.H. Mullins Company of Salem, Ohio. Now, it's a, it's a standard um, uh, kind of accepted truism that many of these soldiers' monuments were ordered from national catalogs. I found in my research on the main monuments that in many ways this was not true, that, and when we get into the granite monuments of the soldiers in a few moments, I'll point out that many of these were actually created by local monument works. But in this case, someone went to a catalog and ordered uh, this sculpture. Another of these uh, very elaborate monuments with uh, the bronze soldier, in this case holding the flag, and I have a very strong feeling this could be a, a mail order sculpture, I just haven't found the catalog yet. Uh, this is the monument in Bridgeton, and uh, the granite was furnished by Hollowell, but we don't know who created the bronze uh, statue. It was dedicated in 1910 and was a gift from Governor Henry Cleves. Both he and his brother had been in the Civil War. Now we turn to one of the most special and moving Civil War monuments in Maine. This is the monument in Brownfield. And while we have the replication of uh, General Hiram Berry in Rockland, that of course is in a, in a private setting, his family plot. The only public monument, uh, other than perhaps the Admiral Farragut in uh, Monument Square, the only public monument to show a, a main soldier is this one. The individual immortalized in Brownfield is Private Daniel Bean of uh, Company 1, 11th Maine Regiment Infantry. He, elected, he enlisted at the age of 16 uh, and was sworn in by his father. And you see he's standing, taking the oath uh, for the army. Uh, he was um, enlisted by his father, who was a first lieutenant in the same company. Joined in 1861, he was severely wounded in Virginia in May of 1862. And after prolonged recuperation, he returned to the regiment in May of 1864 only to be mortally wounded on June 2nd, 1862, or 64, and he's buried in the National Cemetery in Hampton, Virginia. 
The sculpture is by a Boston sculptor, John Wilson, and was cast at the Gorham Company in Providence, Rhode Island, which was one of the finest uh, creators of, of silver and bronze work in late 19th and early 20th century America. Many people are familiar with Gorham silver, and this is where the sculpture was created. And it was based directly upon this photograph of Private Bean that, like the photograph of uh, General Barry, was taken by Matthew Brady in New York. So it's just, again, just one of these lucky uh, tricks of fate that these men had these full-length photographs taken, that the photographs survived decades afterwards, and this uh, uh, wonderful sculpture could be created uh, based upon the photograph. One of the later monuments to show uh, a soldier in bronze is the monument in Westbrook. The base is of Vermont granite, but the bronze figure is by a noted sculpture, Theo Alice Rubbles Kitson of Massachusetts, and this too was cast by Gorham in Providence. It's a very nice sculpture. It has a sense of action to it. Most of them are the silent sentinels, standing more or less at attention and guard. This man is jauntily moving along with his rifle slung over his shoulder. Now, there were a few monuments that were created out of what were known as white metal, a kind of a, a, a composite alloy, alloy material that could be molded into very elaborate Victorian design. And Maine has maybe only two or three of these. This is the one in Biddeford from 1887. It was known as white metal or white bronze. And here is the one in uh, Mechanic Falls from 1887 also done in what was called white bronze. This casting allowed for much more intricate detailing and very elaborate lettering on these monuments. Now let's turn to the most popular form of main Civil War monument, the granite base and the granite standing sentinel soldier. The first of these that we know of in granite was created for Booth Bay Center and we see it here uh, in this wonderful turn of the century photograph of the beautiful New England church at the center and the monument at the left. This was erected in 1878. Here in uh, granite, the monument in front of uh, the Iander Stockton County Courthouse in Auburn, Hollowell Granite, 1882. The monument in Ellsworth. 1887, created by a local uh, monument works from Blue Hill, run by a man named Howard. The monument in Castine, 1887, the Hollowell Granite Works. Way up in Lincoln, the same year, 1887, the Hollowell Granite Works. Here's the monument on the common of the green in Union in Knox County, 1888, created by a local monument worker, John Dornan of East Union. The monument in Dexter, adjacent to the town hall, created by Morse and Bridges of Dexter, who were monument men. The old monument in Camden, like the one in South Paris, in the middle of the street, and moved to a park now. 1899. The monument in South Berwick, 1901. Lubeck, 1904. Freeport, 1906. And at this dedication um, of this monument, uh, General Joshua Chamberlain spoke. Next in sequence, uh, York Village, 1906. There are those who, who say that the monument at York is not really a Union soldier, but a Confederate soldier, and that the, the order got switched. <laughs> And here is Bethel in 1908, how it fits into this sequence. Kennebunk, 
also 1908. Holton, the rustic, 1909, in the city park next to the library. The little town of Canton, or what's left of it, uh, 1910, 1910. This is uh, Berwick, 1911. Gray, 1911, created by an Italian marble worker from Auburn named Como. Winthrop in 1911. Wilton in 1912. Denmark in 1913. And finally, Bremen below Waldebro in 1916. So literally we have from the 1870s right up to World War I, town after town creating the granite base and the granite standing soldier as the almost universal monument in Maine. This form was also used for monuments outside of the state. The state of Maine contributed a great deal of, of time and money to memorializing the men and the regiments who had served in various battles in the South. And this is just one of many examples this is a, a statue that was created by the Bodwell Granite Company on Vinyl Haven around 1900 as Maine's tribute to her soldiers who died while prisoners of war at Salisbury, North Carolina. And of course, Gettysburg has many Maine monuments, all of them coming from the Hollow of Granite Works, and all of them financed by the state of Maine. Indeed, here we have the classic photograph of the dedication of one of the Gettysburg monuments, and a particularly special one. The monument itself, over at the left, is just a very simple uh, rectangular uh, uh, granite monument. The uh, banner is the Maltese Cross for the Fifth Corps, and this is the gathering of the 20th Maine members dedicating their monument uh, in uh, Gettysburg on October 3rd, 1889, and of course, Joshua Chamberlain, if you look at the man just under the banner and then move to the reclining man and then to the right to the man with the, with the gray whiskers, that's Joshua Chamberlain. Now, some communities, for one reason or another, did not have the capability to raise the funds to create a sculptured monument. And so they did the next best thing, and they created uh, their own kind of personal uh, local uh, version. Here is the Bodenham monument. Bodenham heard that the government uh, would make available to towns a surplus Civil War cannon down at Fort Popham uh, in Phippsburg, at the mouth of the Kennebec River, and so the, uh, the veterans of, um, uh, of uh, Bodenham in 1909 hauled one of the Civil War cannon back to Bodenham and set it on this concrete slab. Uh, and uh, there we have uh, one of the ladies of Bodenham uh, in, uh, in the foreground with their Civil War monument. Greenville, uh, at the turn of the century, took a simple local rock. Uh, put on a, pl a plaque on the rock, and added a metal eagle. And that was their Civil War monument. In Washington, they got a little creative. Uh, at the time of the 100th anniversary of the town of Washington, they created this elaborate rustic stone monument in the center of town with a bronze plaque listing the names of all of the men from Washington who had served in the Civil War. Down in Jonesport, right after they built the library in 1915, they did this very simple granite um, monument with a simple bronze plaque. And as late as 1931, again, 
this simple granite monument with bronze plaques in strong man next to the library. In contrast to these very humble monuments in small main communities, in a few cases, entire buildings were designed and built as Civil War memorials. The first of these in Maine, and one of the first in the nation, was this beautiful Victorian structure in the Mansard style that was built on the old Colby College campus on the Kennebec River, designed by uh, Alexander Espy, who was a noted uh, Boston architect. Uh, it was a rubble stone that was quarried from a local quarry, uh, and uh, it was used for both the library and the chapel for the college. But embedded in the library section was this special memorial area to the men who had fallen from Colby in the Civil War. And it's a fascinating story. The marble plaque lists the names in Latin, uh, and then above it, in the niche, uh, is by the Boston sculptor Martin Milmore, who had done that early standing soldier that was then used in the Waterville, um, uh, Waterville monument. Milmore was called upon to do an American interpretation of Thor Walson's Lion of Lucerne, which was a memorial in Lucerne, Switzerland, to the Swiss Guard. The inspiration for this came from Major Henry Burridge, who was our first state historian. Burridge at the time was a young Baptist minister. He'd served in the Civil War. He'd visited uh, the Lion of Lucerne. And when the Colby president and trustees were discussing what would be Colby's monument, Burridge stepped forward with a photograph of the Lion of Lucerne. And everybody said, oh, that's what we want. And the president went down and engaged Milmore to create the American version. And on, on the lion shield are the, 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 uh, the stripes of the flag and the stars. Um, this was rescued from the building when it was torn down in the 1960s when the old campus was vacated and is now in the library at Colby. Although, as a Colby alumnus, I can say, I wish it had a more prominent location than it has in the basement. <laughs> Very nearby Colby, in the little town of West Waterville, an industrial town that then be, shortly became known as Oakland, this very elaborate Gothic Revival town hall was built by the town and by the Grand Army of the Republic Post, the Veterans Post. And it was called Memorial Hall. And rather than erecting a monument, the community decided to create this beautiful community hall, which is still used as a gathering place and as town offices. Likewise, when the people of Skowhegan debated what they would do, it was just at the time that they, in the late 1880s, when they were building their public library. And so the veterans contributed toward the construction of the public library and in turn received uh, beautiful stained glass windows. The three lower windows of the left-hand bay are Civil War memorial windows. And over the fireplace in this library, the Skowhegan Free Public Library, are the names of the men from Skowhegan. In Belfast in 1890, the veterans teamed up with the, the, the city of Belfast and created Memorial Hall, which had the dual purpose of a veterans hall and a city hall. And when the old Civil War veterans finally faded away in the 1920s and 30s, the city of Belfast took it over entirely for their town hall. And at the time, in memory of the veterans, they erected that little obelisk in 1923. And all it says on it is, the boys of 1861. High Road in 1915, on the verge of America going into World War I, built this simple little bungalow style library, which was dedicated to the Civil War uh, from, uh, from um, Hiram and known as Soldiers Memorial Library. And in a church on Pine Street in Bangor, this beautiful memorial window was installed in 1882 to the memory of Captain John Ayres of Bangor, who had served in the 11th Maine Regiment. 
Sadly, this window may not survive. The church burned some years after this photograph was taken, and we're not sure of the fate of the window. But fortunately, we still have this beautiful color slide out. Well, as we can see, the memorialization of the Civil War, of the war of itself, of its battles, and especially of its participants, was a major force in the post-Civil War psyche of Maine towns and Maine people. Here we see a Memorial Day exercise in the town square in South Paris in 1878. There's that simple obelisk erected in 1868, all decorated with wreaths and with garlands. Here is the dedication of the Civil War monument in 1895 in uh, Dover Foxcroft, with veterans of the 6th Maine surrounding the square uh, of the dedication. And here we have the dedication in Bethel, and you have this very photograph in your case uh, behind Randy, uh, 1908, Memorial Day 1908. Memorial Day was a particularly popular date, obviously, for the dedication of these memorials. A year later, in 1909, up in Aroostook County, the dedication of the Civil War Monument in Holton. <coughs> and two years later, the dedication of the monument in Winthrop. These were great public gatherings with tremendous uh, emotional force, and oftentimes a major figure from Maine in the Civil War would give the principal address, and uh, Chamberlain spoke at many of these events. And so the veterans marched into history. This is a photograph of grand old soldiers in Brooks, Maine, around 1910. But the monuments to their achievements in battle to preserve the Union are still very much a part of our life and our landscape. From the magnificent statue in the square in Portland to a very humble shaft near Bangor in a crossroads town of Herman, and I might say I visited this monument recently. The only thing that is still there from this photograph after 100 years is that monument. Everything else has changed. It's the most radical change I've seen in the photograph. But somehow, people respect these monuments. To the first monument in Bangor of Granite, 1864. And of course, scattered all over Maine in countless cemeteries are the private memorials, the ones erected by grieving families. This is a stone in marble in West Peru for Isaac P. Wing, who died uh, in the Civil War, aged 15 and 10 months. He may have been a drummer boy, whatever, although a lot of times, of course, young men uh, uh, bent the truth to get into the army, said they were, they were over 18 when they had a slip of paper saying 18 in their shoe. Uh, <laughs> and uh, here we have a local stone cutter creating the standing soldier holding the flag to remember this young man from. And here in Bethel, as I've shown already a couple times, you have your own special and beautiful tribute to the Civil War on Main Street. And while Main Streets change, houses, buildings, and trees come and go, these memorials, these silent sentinels, seem to be a constant in our lives and our communities. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sure. I wonder, is there any, um, I don't notice anything. 
particular orientation of the way these statues are facing? Well, that's a good question. Of course, um, the tradition is that they face that they face south. <laughs> and um, one of the things that I've been doing since I initially developed this lecture in the winter for the Civil War Roundtable in Brunswick, and of course, wintertime in Maine is not a good time to go <coughs> visit cemeteries and, and, <laughs> and small villages in remote places. Um, but I have been this spring um, going to the monuments, and I've now visited about 45 out of the more than 100, and I'm photographing them, and I'm actually plotting them on maps. And one of the things I want to do when I get the data together is test that theory, you know, to see what the orientations are. Uh, and, and I think, you know, by, by nature, some of them are facing the south, but uh, it may not always be true. Yeah. And, and you know, curious thing, when I got to, to Lewiston a few weekends ago, for some reason, uh, the bronze statue there, originally, uh, he was facing into the park. And at some point, I 